Hi, everybody. Welcome to another episode of That Early Childhood Nerd. I'm Heather Burnt Santi, and today I'm joined by Richard Cohen. Hi, everybody. And uh, Richard's bald because he shaved his head for charity. <laughs> this is true. I raised uh, over $1,100 for children's uh, cancer research and treatment. Nice. And now I get to rub my fuzzy head. Yeah, it's a good. Um, so my son used to get his head shaved when he was a kid um, a few times. It's a good feeling that just growing back yeah. just like a weekend yep. kind of thing yep um so anyway richard and i are going to talk about uh his article this time and this it's called zen in the art of early childhood education um we will have a link posted when this podcast episode comes out um but it, richard do you want to tell them where to find it or any background information about this before we jump in sure well uh so this was written a few years ago uh, as an introduction to a book that is yet to come out that has been sitting in, we'll just call it litigation heck. Uh, <laughs> but we can cuss on this show, right? Oh, yes. Litigation hell mm -hmm. um, for some years now that I can't really talk about. Um, <laughs> I've been able to sort of um, uh, frame it as an article unto itself. And so, uh, so that's why we're able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, Zen and the Art of Early Childhood Education, which is the name of the article, is also the name of my social media presence on Facebook, um, Instagram, and Twitter. So you can search for that long term, or you could just search for Art of Early Childhood or Art of EC, uh, and you find it on those platforms. And every day I try to put out something uh, educational, uh, interesting research, inspirational, humorous, something for my beloved early childhood educators to um, nourish them. Mm -hmm. And so I've been doing that since 2013. And, and it's so this article, um, as you said, sorry, you'll no. put out the link to it, but also uh, it's pinned to the top of the Facebook page. And you could also go to richardcohen.com and scroll down to various uh, videos and podcasts and articles, including many nerd ones. <laughs> and uh, you'll find the article down there as well. I just was going to say that um, one of the things that I like, because I've, uh, I think I've followed your Facebook as long as it's been up there. Um, oh, I didn't know you were on Twitter though. So I had to write that down to track you down on Twitter. It's all the same thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> but one of the things that I, that I really appreciate is that um, you have sort of a balanced focus and some of what you're posting is about children, but some of it is about taking care of ourselves and thinking about ourselves as adults working with children, um, which I don't see on a lot of other spaces uh, for early yeah. childhood on social media. So well, the, the concept was, oh, no, go ahead. I was going to gonna build jump on in what there. you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's in that first part of the article that, um, Listeners, you will be saddened and ju judgmental to know that Heather printed it out and she can't see the first paragraph <laughs> because of the way she printed it. Um, that is a sorry nerd. It really saying. is. I feel shame. You should. Um, <laughs> uh, but anyway, what it says in that article that she can't see is that um, the whole, my whole idea behind the Zen and Art of Early Childhood Education, which is what Heather was just alluding to a moment ago, is that um, I started noticing that some of uh, the world's and history's kind of greatest wisdom that we all look towards uh, to guide our lives um, was really, really relevant in my thinking to early childhood education. And the more I started thinking about early childhood education as uh, being far more than about colors, letters, numbers, and shapes, but about introducing little human beings to life, then all of those sayings and proverbs and adages about life, I started realizing they applied to my classroom mm -hmm. um, and to early educators taking care of themselves in order to take care of young children. And so that was kind of the impetus for the whole thing. Mm -hmm. um, and even though I can't see that paragraph, I know yes. that's what's in there. So I was going to ask you <laughs> to talk about that. So you did, okay. you did just exactly what I was going to make you do anyway. So Yay. Whatever that's worth. Um, so, so the article is divided into uh, several sections. So we're just going to kind of jump in uh, to, the to, the to each one and see 
um, where it goes. So the, the next section then is on reflection. Um, and and ref reflection, reflective practitioners, reflective teachers, whatever you want to use, has was one of the things that was really eye-opening for me when I moved into positions of where I was quote unquote training teachers when I was a child care center director. It was surprising to me to find that that's not something that comes natural for everybody. That I that that willingness to ability to experience with. Um, reflecting on what you think about children, what you're doing with children and, and making connections or even new information you hear about working with children um, and that piece of it. Um, so, so I guess just, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts on, on reflection and. Sure. Well, you know, we early childhood professionals are a subset um, of uh, all humanity. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and um, I don't think we're all uh, born into a human culture that encourages reflection, yeah. that encourages us to think about what we're doing. Certainly not in this sort of modern world uh, where we just want to use the microwave or drive through and uh, get our thing, get our product, get, get it done. Uh, we don't have time to reflect. That's not really a cultural value. Mm -hmm. And so therefore we find ourselves as a group of professionals um, not um, prepared, generally speaking, for that. Like you say, you, you thought it was, you were used to doing it, but you were surprised that most of the early childhood professionals around you weren't. And I just think that's a function of being human. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to, you know, one of the things I love about early childhood educators is uh, the best ones anyway is we in, intentionally, and that word will come up soon in the next section, but we intentionally sort of stand outside of the stream uh, of the culture um, and plant our feet and look around um, and say, wait, let's, let's really be thoughtful about what we're doing. Um, are we doing what's best serving other people's young children? And so as far as reflection goes, um, there's two kinds. Uh, I would say there's professional reflection. Mm -hmm. So that's our ability to reflect on what we're doing while we're doing it or reflect afterwards. Like, why did that activity that I put so much effort into bringing to the children totally bomb? What was it? Let mm -hmm. me figure that one out so that I can write it down so it doesn't happen again next time. Um, that's the professional reflection. or That's mm -hmm. one aspect of it. I'm reflecting on data, I'm reflecting on my observations of children and the data that's derived from it so that I can plan my curriculum or plan my, my scaffolding and my support of those children. But then there's also personal reflection. Like, who am I as a human being? Um, uh, where did I get the preferences and the biases that I have? And how are they impacting the ways I'm interacting with young children? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for example, did you see that video last year? Uh, it was so simple, but fascinating to me about the caregivers who, so they had babies in a room, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, some of the babies, they dressed in pink dresses and some of the babies they dressed in, in, in blue shirts and pants. Um, and the genders were not related to the colors they were wearing and the babies were surrounded by toys. Did you see this one? No. Okay. How, and then the, no, you should how find did I miss it? it. Yeah. It. Okay. Yeah. It's really so simple and obvious, but mm -hmm. so beautiful. We're talking about, ultimately what we're talking about here, spoiler alert, is implicit bias. <laughs> uh -huh. So then they would ask caregivers to go into the room and play with the babies. And of course, what they found out in their research is that the caregivers tended to hand the dolls to the babies in pink and ha tended to hand the trucks to the babies in blue. Um, and they didn't even know they were doing it. Uh -huh. It was not a conscious, intentional choice. Um, so that professional reflection is one of those things that helps us notice in this example that many of us um, treat boys and girls differently, not even realizing the short and long-term impacts of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it seems to me, as I'm listening to, to you talk about those two types of reflection, um, that... The professional reflection 
might be more comfortable than the personal reflection. <laughs> Maybe that's Absolutely. like stating the obvious, but um, so I'm, I'm thinking, but, but even the professional can be really difficult. Like I'm, your example of um, why did that activity tank so often when an activity tanks, um, uh, we were talking, so sidebar, we were talking last night in my living room about, not you and me, Richard, but the people in my living room, about needing to and have- just for the audience, that's because I've never once been invited to Heather's living room. I just want to point that out. <laughs> You're always invited. Um, okay, so anyway, uh, about the need for an air quote sound for the podcast. So <laughs> yes. we do it so often. And um, my husband then said, well, we need that the Victor Borga sound from when he used to- make mm. punctuation and I was like no there's right. like three people in the audience who are going to know what that means so I tell <laughs> the story for you three people who know what that is referring to but anyway when an activity tanks what I see most most often is is the adults thinking about well how can I change the behavior of the children so that this doesn't tank again um, right. and it's 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 very difficult to switch that around to let's look at the whole picture what what could what could have been feeding whatever it was that, that affected that activity. And that's difficult right. enough, but then you throw in asking someone to reflect on whether they have implicit biases that are affecting the way they interact with children. And, uh, and, I, and you're asking a lot. I'm not saying that you're asking too much or that it's unfair to ask, but I think that's really a big ask. Well, so... In terms of professional reflection, mm -hmm. two thoughts come to mind. Mm -hmm. One, this is the place where we, and you hear this phrase thrown around, this is the place where we bridge theory to practice, mm -hmm. right? So we learned all this stuff in school or in the 10 million books that the early childhood nerd has read. <laughs> but the ability to take that and apply it to real children in some random moment is really hard for a lot mm -hmm. of people. It's yeah. a real challenge. And so professional reflection is the act of taking that abstract idea called zone of proximal development or fill in the blank and then really saying okay what's how do i connect that to what's actually happening with this child who's um struggling with um holding a crayon mm -hmm. so that's that's professional reflection is what helps us bridge theory to practice um it's also uh i forgot my second thought now um I'll just look at you. Yeah, it's you, gone. You remember. Oh, okay, good. I'm glad it's not just me that that happens to. <laughs> no, it's not. Yeah. It's those of us old enough to, to know who Victor Borg is. <laughs> it tends to happen to. Yeah. Although my 27 year old son knows who he is, but that's because his grandpa used to watch it when he was watching. Oh yeah. That's true. Um, okay. So, so um, mm -hmm. I think what you're, what you were just saying about the professional reflection piece then shows how important it is to have side by side in the moment coaching with teachers and class and, and, and caregivers, because the going to sending somebody to a Saturday workshop, and I'm a fan of Saturday workshops. That's not what I'm saying here, but um, about theory is not the same as having someone in the, in the space with you who has had some practice themselves making those connections. Because I think one of the best ways to start, making those connections is to, to have someone else who says, see, you're already doing it. When you did this, that was Piaget. Or when you did this, that was whoever. Um, and then they, it's like, it's like constructive, constructivist learning, right? We, we know we, we can start to label what we're already doing and then we can build on it because we're more aware than we were before someone brought that to our attention. Yeah, absolutely. Some of the most exciting work that I've done um, and I've just done so many different things across my career, I know. Um, which has just been fun. Like um, just that, I had no idea that was going to be my journey, but it was. But um, in terms of my consulting work, when I when like uh, I'll have a city, like a like a, a city that will hire me um, uh, to come for a week, and so then I'll spend the week coaching, um, and I have a specific method of coaching that we can. I can mention. Um, and then it, then the week culminates in a day long workshop or conference where we can reflect on all the stuff that we had been talking about during coaching. And then you put them in small groups and they can talk about all that stuff. 
And that's where the magic happens mm -hmm. when you can have both the coaching and then kind of the debrief to me anyway, the debrief and the formal reflection on um, the real life experiences. Mm -hmm. um, so my coaching uh, uh, is called metacognitive coaching. Uh, so one of my big things is mindfulness mm -hmm. and separating ourselves uh, from our thoughts and feelings and being able to stand outside and notice them from a place of compassion. And so um, when I coach people, um, I don't say, why did you just do that? Or do you <laughs> notice when you did that, that was Piaget. Uh -huh. um, my, and I, I have to explain this to people beforehand, otherwise they think it's just weird and they get thrown off by it. Mine is always, so think, just take a moment and think about what you were thinking when you made that choice. What was the thought going through your mind? I really want you to start um, noticing your thinking. Mm -hmm. And then you can later reflect on where did that thinking come from in your childhood, in, your, in how you were raised. Mm -hmm. But right now I need you to just notice the thinking that's driving your behaviors. Um, that's what I find most effective to help teachers transform their behaviors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, well, I think that's definitely a, um, I mean, I think anytime we ask someone a question like that about their practice, there's going to be a level of defensive reaction. But I think that is such a, um, let's just, let's just meet right here where we are and, and start with the very basics that maybe it's less, less threatening for people. Yeah. To hear that question in the moment. You are not your thoughts, mm -hmm. but you have them. And yeah. what's going to be most helpful to you is for you to compassionately notice that uh, they're driving you. Uh -huh. And think about now that you've learned about Piaget or whatever, um, why you might want to start thinking differently and then mm -hmm. acting differently out of those new thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, uh, unless you remember what you were going to say about I personal don't. reflection about implicit bias we're going to move so on to gone. the next section okay well that's cool we can always come back if it pops right. back into your brain so either, the next section is on intentionality and this is actually one of my favorite words <laughs> um to use and to think about um but i i think it's sort of getting really close to buzzword status in the field sure um, both of these and, reflection and intentionality right right to where we sort of use it a lot but but don't think about what we mean and we don't stop to define terms so that two people who are using it know they're talking about the same thing. But um, so this is, this is part of the section that I heard in your um, Facebook live with um, Active Childhood UK, is that right? Yeah, mm -hmm. was, was this section and you started by talking about the quote that you use here from Rhonda Byrne, intention leads to manifestation. We create our lives with every thought, every minute of every day. Um, so I think a lot of times when people talk about being an intentional teacher, they think about the planning and what we're putting on paper and what we're putting on the shelves and what we plan to do um, and being intentional about that. But I think this is a much deeper, much more personal sort of idea of intention. So tell, tell me why, you ch what, why Rhonda Burns right? Well, that's a loaded question right there. <laughs> I wouldn't say Rhonda Byrne is right. Okay. In the context of her book, The Secret, uh -huh. um, her, her idea about a, a, a very um, boiled down version of her idea about intentionality was that, you know, you make your vision board and you set your intention and you pin on your vision board that picture of a red Porsche. And if you just keep focusing on that intention, you can manifest a red Porsche into your life. Um, and because the early childhood nerd podcast is what it is. I can say, I think that's bullshit. Ah, yes. Um, uh, I made a vision I, board I, once. <laughs> how'd that go for you? Um, well, it was a dating vision board, so it went okay, but not because of the vision board. I mean, it was, it's all okay. Maybe but. Rhonda would say it was because of the vision board. <laughs> it was more just fun to sit with my friends and make a vision board than it was anything else. Right. Anyway, so sorry. I but to, the point of the vision I board is well taken. Why I might start giggling? Okay. Well, which is the inverse? That mm -hmm. if you don't have a clear intention, it's much more statistically um, unlikely that you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. So to at least start with, this is my goal, right? And so you have some teachers who say, 
and they think this is my goal. I need to make sure that children learn all 26 letters, all eight colors, and however many shapes by the time they're done with me. And then in June, I can exhale and say, okay, that was my intention and I met it, right? Mm -hmm. um, but then there are others who, are, who, would, who might say, um, my intention is to be present with the children, to follow their lead at all times, um, to refine my curriculum based on their interest and what's meaningful to them. And if, you, if you're clear on that intention, the, on either of those, let's say, um, the way you teach is very, very different. Mm -hmm. But either way, it starts with that intention. But I'll tell you, the one thing I learned, the, my greatest lesson in intentionality was in my last role as a center director. Mm -hmm. And God bless the, the um, teachers in the newborn infant room. Um, oh my God, that job is so intense. Yes. From the moment they get to work to the moment they leave. And then of course after, because they love those kids. <laughs> it's just a whole life uh -huh. of intensity when you're with newborns. So I was constantly running into the newborn room to give them support because one to four is nice two to eight um, is, it's just so intense. Uh -huh. So I spent a lot of time with newborns um, and that was a joy. Yeah. But the thing that really hit me around intentionality was um, trying to get newborns to sleep. Um, when it was clear, they were sending you messages that they really needed to sleep, but they just, they were doing everything but that. They couldn't, mm -hmm do that yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so the teachers would say to me, wow, Richard, you're magical. You come in and you can get these babies to sleep that none of us can get to fall asleep. Mm -hmm. And so as I would stand there over that crib, right, that horrible crib that met all the regulations yeah. that had nothing in it but a baby, mm -hmm. right, no nothing on their backs. Um, and I would Every little movement of mine and thought of mine, I was trying to be present and intentional. Um, now I'm putting my hand on your tubby, on your tummy. Now I'm rubbing it in a clockwise circle. <laughs> Wait a minute, I need to do that more slowly. I need to slow down the circle. Okay, now I'm singing you this song. Um, uh, what was the song I used to sing? Uh, inchworm, oh, inchworm. Yeah. And I would sing it over and over. And that was very mm -hmm. intentional, the repetitiveness, uh -huh. the just like, I am going to bore you to sleep. <laughs> um, God damn it. Um, and now I'm going, I'm still rubbing and I'm saying, now I'm going to slow it down. Now I'm going to just have my hand on your tummy because I see your eyes are fluttering. And now I'm going to raise it the tiniest bit so you can feel the heat of my hand, but I'm not moving any other part of my body and I'm going to keep singing. And now I'm going to pull my hand away a little bit. And I've never been more intentional mm. than in that moment. I never really realized intent, what intentionality meant fully uh, until it was directed at a newborn and what it took from me very intentionally um, in that example to get them to fall asleep mm -hmm. or help them fall asleep. Yeah. And I think that's a good example i mean it's it's a beautiful story but it's also a good example of um being in the moment um and yeah. making your decisions based on the thing that's in front of you and not the seven other babies behind you because you knew that there were other adults in the room for those for those right. babies and sometimes that's the case sometimes it's not when your work is trying to yeah. stay in the child but um yeah. But it's so easy to be looking forward to what you need to get to next or what happens after. Um, and, and that can get in the, in the way of your intentionality, I think. Trying to constantly think of what comes next or what do I need to do next and what is this keeping me from? Uh, and that's Well, that's now we don't even need to talk thing. about the next section or whatever the, that one is, which is on staying present. Oh, the next one is the foolishness, moment. actually. Well, it's coming up, though. Okay. But you just said it so perfectly. I don't have more to add. <laughs> well, you will by then, I bet. We'll get okay. there. We'll get there. You know me too well. <laughs> um, so then the next section is, that's a good segue, just to correct you and say it's on <laughs> foolishness. <laughs> Again, for you listeners, uh, Heather and I can see each other visually, 
and she's taking so much joy in correcting me. I haven't seen her smile this big in a long time. I just want to point that out. <laughs> um, well, it's rare. It's a rare thing. I'm trying to be in the moment. <laughs> I'm trying to really enjoy it. Um, okay, so the next section you're talking about foolishness. Um, and uh, and I, I think the first sentence of this section is a good starting point. And you say, while the outcomes of early education can frequently be very serious business, we must never forget that there's always room for fun. So you're not talking necessarily about things that are foolish, stupid. You're talking about allowing ourselves to be, to look foolish sometimes. It yeah, that's a good point. I really think of, is that, of yeah. that definition of foolishness. Yeah. Well, that's, again, um, that's why I'm here to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> to make me look like a fool. To make, to make you look foolish. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Make your case. For um, another definition I love the court of foolishness. Jester. Uh -huh. I'd rather be the court jester than the king. Um, if you look back in history, the court jester often had more power than the king because the court jester knew how to influence the king. Mm. The king may have been the decision maker, but the court jester um, really was quite political in his, I'd like to say his or her, but I, I don't know how many female court jesters there were at the time. <laughs> um, in their role, they had great influence. Um, humor is, you know, I don't need to state the obvious, especially now as we sit in the middle of this pandemic, mm -hmm. is so therapeutic, is so healing. It's so important to the human experience, laughter and joy and playfulness. Um, and so, um, you know, again, if my job is to introduce new beings into this world and say, hey, this is what it means to be a human being, um, why would I not want them to celebrate that part of the human experience yeah um and that's really hard for a lot of people in the world and that subset of people of we talked about this the other day nice people that get hired in our field mm -hmm. with no early childhood or child development background but the director's desperate for a warm body and so they hire them because they're nice mm -hmm. um a lot of those lovely nice people um are really backed up about looking foolish and silly Mm -hmm. um, or here's another aspect of it, mm -hmm. um, or another illustration of it. Um, so I taught community college. I've, I'm currently teaching community college and I taught it once before in St. When I lived in St. Louis, Missouri, um, I taught at St. Louis community college in Ferguson, Missouri, uh, before, during, and after the shooting of Michael Brown and the riot that ensued. I was right there in Ferguson. Um, and primarily my students at that time were grown women for the most part in their 30s 40s 50s 60s 70s who because of state funding had to get their associate's degree mm -hmm. and they filled my class mm -hmm. these women and 99.9% .9 were women so i can say that these women had absolutely no problem singing dancing being silly playing games mm -hmm. um I don't know. They were older. They were they were in a stage of a developmental stage of their life where looking foolish was kind of um, not such a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, they were past it. Um, but if I wanted to have conversations with them about anti bias education and so sociological phenomenon, that was mm -hmm. really difficult for them. Now I find myself in Hartford, Connecticut, a uh, similar population in terms of uh, ethnicity and poverty. But now my students are 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. They are right there eager to talk about um, sociological phenomenon, but I cannot get them up <laughs> singing and dancing for the, and playing for the life uh -huh. of me because they're so developmentally into looking good. Yeah. And that foolishness thing is just so hard for them at that stage, at that adolescent Checks stage out. of their life. Mm -hmm. But so key to, um, to being an effective early childhood educator. Well, I, I think, um, I mean, I, I don't doubt that for a minute that checks out for me, with my experience and knowledge of being in one demographic and knowing people in the other. Um, but I, I, I think it's easier to do those, maybe, maybe this is just me, it's easier to do those kinds of things in front of children than it is in front of other adults so absolutely so maybe they're you know they're seeing you do it they're not comfortable doing it in the classroom but with you but they're gonna jump in with some three-year-olds 
try some of the things they see you doing is my hope. That's true. That's where I hope it goes. Um, That's true. What, uh, so I'm going to, maybe this is going to put you on the spot, but probably not. What would you say? Um, let's, so let's pretend you're a, you're a teacher being foolish in a classroom with children and um, an administrator walks in and challenges that because it's not, um, it doesn't look like learning. And so what would your, what would your response be? Uh, well, so first of all, you're asking me for a reaction to mm -hmm. my administrator, right. Right? right? And one of the other things that's key to being an effective early childhood professional, you and I, I think have talked about this before, though it's not in this particular article, is proactivity. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was, I'm just remembering when I was interviewing for that child director job a couple of years back, they did something similar. Here's a scenario, a teacher's doing this, how do you react? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, actually um, in my center, if I were the director, um, that would never have happened to begin <laughs> with um, because we long since would have been having professional development, ongoing coaching, conversations, about um, why you're not going to put the child in their cubby when they misbehave, right? Uh, and so I don't need to answer your question about how I would react mm -hmm. because I would have done been doing so many things proactively. Um, and so, you know, I often say when I, back in the 80s, when I took all of my child development classes and went to school and got my degrees and blah, 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 no one ever told me that I was going to find myself in a profession where quite often, I knew more about early education and child development than my supervisor. Mm -hmm. And that part of my job as a child advocate um, was to educate them. It's not in the job description. Um, as a white male, um, I'm so powered and privileged that it doesn't scare me to speak up to a supervisor, right? And so I totally own the privilege around that. Mm -hmm. But that's how I've spent my life is handing articles to directors, um, explaining myself before they even ask. And so um, because of that, I would never find myself in that moment where they would have asked, why are you doing that silly thing? I would have been putting out parent newsletters explaining the value of play and silliness. I would have been CCing my director on those newsletters. All of those things would have happened so that uh, I wouldn't ever fear that she would be surprised when she walked in my classroom. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I don't know if that answers your question. It does. That's, no, that's okay. so. Because, so I was as you were talking, I just kept thinking. You know, there's somebody who's listening right now, going, "Well, that won't work because my administrator wouldn't go for it." So um, I just wanted to give you a chance to process that a little bit for people uh, to hear. I think. Well, the other I mean, thing I, I would add is that a lot of um, so yeah, so a lot of early childhood professionals um, make the mistake of. So let's see, let's go back to intentionality for a, a moment. Uh -huh. uh, you actually heard me say this in Fostering Grit or some earlier podcast, mm -hmm. which is the importance of teachers being able to give the rationale for why they're doing whatever they're doing and have it be research-based. And you have a lot of lovely, nice early childhood professionals who say, well, I did it because um, when my kids were young, they loved it. Um, and so that's why I did it. Um, or I know kids love bubbles, and so um, that's why we did it. But if you see yourself as, the, as a, the kind of professional that a lawyer or a doctor or a dentist sees themselves, they know that before they give a recommendation, uh, they have to have done the research and they have to be able to cite the research. Um, what the current studies show is blah, blah, blah. And so um, one, of, one of the things that I do in working with early childhood educators is to remind them to you can't use yourself as your reference um, anytime you do anything you have to be you have to read maybe not as much as that early childhood nerd but you have to read and then you have to be able to cite it to other people and say this is why i'm doing what i'm doing yeah. because this really interesting study said blah 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 yeah yeah that also but, helps when you're talking with parents especially mm -hmm, yes when you're someone like me who doesn't have children of their own and they don't really want to, not sure if they can trust you because you're not a parent. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, you're right. I'm not a parent, but um, let me tell you a little bit about Erickson's research and what I learned. And together, 
um, we can partner to help your child. Mm -hmm. You know your child. I know Erickson. Um, let's figure this one out together. Yeah. Um, that's uh, sort of an approach I take with people a lot who are, when we're having conversations about working with parents specifically, working with families, it's like they, they know their child, you know child care, you know groups, you know theory, whatever, and let's bring it together somehow in a conversation. Maybe not in the moment when the question is asked and we're feeling you know, defensive or challenged or whatever, but find a time to, to do that. I just, so I, I ask that because I know that there are those folks who listen, who think, um, well, I don't have any power. I can't do those things. My administrator wouldn't go for it, but we have more power than we know. We just need to think That's about, right. or, or then we realize we just need to think about ways to exercise it you know, the proactive approach that you described and all those different things you would have done beforehand to sort of manage people's expectations uh -huh. um, sets the stage, but also that's sort of exerting our power um, in a way that maybe someone hadn't thought about. Uh -huh. So thanks. <laughs> I'll give you an example of um, what you just said. We have more power than we know, mm -hmm. which is so often true, but I'll give you an extreme example. Mm -hmm. I was saying how I loved my consulting work where I can spend a week coaching and then culminate in a big workshop. So I did that at a, an Air Force base many years ago. Um, I won't say which Air Force base, but um, it was at a child development center on the Air Force base, which tended to be staffed by the wives of uh, the active military uh, males. Um, and these were women who are, again, were just amazing and intelligent and lovely and all the things you want, but that most of them did not have formal early childhood or child development backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And so as I spent my time with these women uh, and listening to them and coaching them, they would say, oh, no, that's again. And now remember, this is military, right? Yeah. So they're in a context of rules and um, following the uh -huh. rules is the number one thing. And, mm -hmm. Hierarchies, not about I'm an empowered person, mm -hmm. I'm someone who follows the rules. So I kept hearing that in my coaching. Oh no, that's against the rules. No, 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 you can't do that. Uh, let children climb up the slide, um, paint with water on a wall outside. That's, it would get the wall wet, that's, got, that's against the rules. <laughs> it would get so the wall wet. So I started making a Sorry. list of all these rules. <laughs> okay. And then every day, right? But <laughs> But mm -hmm. it's really human. It's their it's really reality, typical. yes. It's uh -huh. an extreme version, yeah. but I think that's true for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I started listing all these things that people were saying were rules. And at the end of each day, I'd meet with the director as we led up to this conference. And so this conference started with me on big chart paper, listing all the rules uh, that I had heard over that week. And then I had asked the director ahead of time, can you speak to these rules and let us know, maybe you can come up here with your marker and circle, which ones are actually rules and which ones are the ones that people just think are rules, mm -hmm. but are just, they've sort of somehow decided that in their minds. And if there were 30 rules up there on that list, maybe three or four of them were actual rules. And the rest of them were just disempowered people who weren't in the habit of thinking for themselves and stepping out. And they had decided in their minds that they were rules, even though they weren't. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of us do that in our lives personally and professionally. And, and listen, I'll say this without getting too political, maybe. Um, our current president has been a great example of um, showing the difference between sort of rules and laws and norms and all these things that we thought were immutable. Mm -hmm. And you see these, this current president um, just ignoring them. Oh, it turns out that wasn't a law. That right. was just a norm. Yeah. You don't actually have to do that. Uh -huh. um, and that's been an incredible lesson for me. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's... I think we'll just move on from there. <laughs> well, there are some people who that's exactly what they love about our president. I know. That he, yes. Right. And then there yeah. are some people that uh, it infuriates. Mm -hmm. But either way, I think we can all agree that that's one of his hallmarks and that yeah. we've all learned something about um, what are actually laws and rules 
and what were just norms and traditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which which I think really does translate into or connect to the example that you were giving of the, you know, the Air Force program where they had all the rules. Because I think there are people in child care programs um, who delight in those rules. And um, then there are those who um, delight in proving that they're not really rules. <laughs> I think you and I are in the latter group. I do too. I'm pretty sure. I do too. And it's definitely gotten me into trouble. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> and probably you too. We should do an episode on getting in trouble. Yeah, okay. At some point. That would be great. I have some great stories of how right yeah, I've always too. been. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> okay, so the next section then is the one um, uh, on being present that we were talking about a minute ago that we sort of, of teased, I guess. Um, so, so the section is on being present. It reminded me a lot of, um, so on, on Saturdays this month, we're doing a virtual book discussion of Emily Plank's oh. Discovering the Culture of Childhood. And the, you know, the theme is that there is a specific culture that we as adults don't remember anymore because we're so far removed from it. We see things through our adult lens. Um, you know, the children are seeing things through their lens, and we need to we need to work through that somehow. And so, in in this section of your of your article, you talk about um, you know children's spheres are smaller, so they tend to live more in the present moment and right here than us grown ups. So it connected for me when I read this to the conversations we've been having in that book discussion group. Um, but I want to ask you to expand on that a little bit and explain how that connects to being present. Sure. Well, the sphere of experience is um, a human being's um, understanding or experience of both space and time, right? So this section starts with a quote from Ram Das, who says, be here now. I'm an old science fiction nerd I and so here is about space tattoo of that by the way you do it's be temporary. Here now? yeah mm -hmm. temporary i haven't used it yet but it's in my oh, box of temporary okay. tattoos yeah anyway got it mm -hmm. um so here is about space and now is about time mm -hmm. and there's nothing i love to jabber on more about than the space time continuum oh my God. Um, <laughs> and our understandings of space and time so when we're very little our understandings are <clears throat> That sphere is very small. Our understanding of space and time is very small. We live very much here and very much now. Mm -hmm. um, when I'm an infant and my diaper is wet, I'm not crying because I nostalgically remember a time when it was dry. <laughs> and I'm not crying because I'm hopeful of a future in which it'll be dry. I'm crying because right now it's warm and wet and yucky and it doesn't feel good. Um, and we forget that. Yeah. We grown-ups, mm -hmm. because our spheres are so big, um, even though my body is present, my mind can wander back to that argument I had with my sister 20 years ago that I'm still pissed about. <laughs> or I can be appearing to be present, but I'm actually thinking about my retirement, which often gets a lot of laughs in an early childhood. Right. Because how many of us actually have money saved up for retirement? Right. But the point is, it's really challenging for us to stay in the here and the now. And we have to remember that the ones we're caring for, are that's where they are. Mm -hmm. They're literally experiencing the world. We're in the, we think we're living the same world in the same moment together. But it's just like you forget animals can't see colors and that their experience of the entire world, some animals, right, um, oh, is totally okay. different than the world we think, even though my dog and I are both looking at the same side. Mm -hmm. uh, and we forget that. And mm -hmm. so we forget that young children um, aren't beset by, by the fretting over the past or the future or worrying about what's happening um, uh, in Wuhan, China, like we grown-ups can be mm -hmm. right now, mm -hmm. um, or Italy. Um, and so uh, understanding that, and then once again, um, being intentional about... Um, Noticing when your mind is wandering somewhere other than here and now, uh, taking a deep breath and then getting yourself back to this moment uh, is what helps you become present with the child and then actually follow their lead and mm -hmm. be a good observer of what's meaningful to them and where they're 
growing edges are and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But it, it starts with getting present. Yeah. And I think that it, that, that thinking more about that, trying to be more intentional about being present, I guess we'll just use all the words, um, gives maybe another, um, I guess, element of, for consideration to thinking about how process oriented children are. The, I think the, the conversation typically ends up being about um, all the things they're learning during that process. But if we shift it and just think about how driven they are to, to just focus on that moment, well, then of course the process is more important than the product because the process is built up of moment on moment on moment that they're moving through in real time, not worried about what this is going to look like at the end or what happens when I'm done with this process. I, I, I don't know if that's making sense, but for me, it, it makes total it, sense to me. It, it, um, it adds a little bit more value to thinking about processes rather than just end products or adult goals. Well, absolutely. You said doing. it perfectly. A process is a moment and then another moment it's a now and a now and a now and a now for a young child, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? Well, for anyone really. Right. But, so the example I often give when I connect that to process versus product is um, the wonderful experience of baking with young children, right? Uh -huh. So there's nothing wrong with you asking, what do you, what do you think this is going to taste like when it comes out of the oven? Do you think it's going to be yummy or yucky? Mm -hmm. Right. Because prediction is an important early right. childhood skill. Right. Nothing wrong and, with that question. And posing but if questions. that's where you stop, yeah. there's a problem. If you understand that children live moment to moment, then you're asking. So it's all about your pattern, your facilitation. Then you're asking, how does it feel to stir? I'm pouring more flour in. Is it getting harder or easier to stir? I could ask it as a predictive question. Uh -huh. Do you think it'll get harder or easier to stir when I pour more flour in? It's not bad. That's important. Again, you've heard me say this in our past discussions. You have to look at your practice over all 10 months or year that you're with the child. Uh -huh. Sometimes you ask questions <clears throat> of prediction, but hopefully most of the time you're just narrating what's happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. And then we get into terms like self-talk and parallel talk. Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, shoot. Now I forgot what I was going to say, but I, I mean, I was going to point back to the article because you do, um, you do talk about how being present should affect the activities that we offer um, yeah. or can affect the activities that we offer. Um, so I just wanted to point back to that for folks who are listening. Um, <laughs> so the next section then is on meaningfulness. Um, and you, you kind of start with, you know, most of us think that the academic stuff is the meaning, the reason that we're here and doing these things with children. Um, and then you say neurological research tells us that human beings learn best when our emotions are involved at a slightly heightened level. So I wanted to, I, most first, I just want you to talk about what you mean by that emotionally heightened level, because I think for some, they'll hear, hear that and they'll think, um, they're upset. You know what I mean? Usually when we're talking about heightened emotions, we're talking about behavior or um, being sad or mad or scared or something like that. So, so explain that to us a little bit, please. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, if you were to see the keynote version of this article, you would see a visual of a spectrum. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the spectrum goes from underwhelm on one end to overwhelm on the other end. And the middle point is our normal level of affect or emotion mm -hmm. at any given moment, generally the, speaking, during the, the whelm. <laughs> yeah, it's the place of whelm. And then there's another point on that spectrum, slightly between, slightly above whelm, um, <laughs> towards overwhelm. Uh -huh. And that's the sweet spot, neurologically speaking, for learning. So if you're underwhelmed, you're bored, that speaker's reading from index cards, um, my poor community college students are like every other class I have, the professor lectures and then I'm supposed to write notes and then I get tested on it. And I don't remember that stuff because he just drones on and on. Um, that's underwhelm. Mm -hmm. Overwhelm is when you are throwing a tantrum. And I'm, that's a whole other conversation. We right. Yeah. I don't like that word, but okay. No, me neither, In other words, but we can use totally it for this. You're totally out of emotional control mm -hmm. um, for that moment. 
um, or you're laughing so hard that you peed your pants just a little bit. Um, that's overwhelm. Sure. When you're in that state, you can't learn. Right. Because um, you're your thinking of is, that nostalgic time when you weren't peeing on yourself. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyway, I'm sorry. I interrupted you. Yes. People who are just <laughs> listening to this podcast, you can't see how old Heather is. Um, that's one of the unfortunate things about it, just listening. Um, she's clearly entered the peeing her pants state. Of life. <laughs> um, and I'll just say, welcome. I've been there for now a few uh-huh. years. Oh, great. Okay, good. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. um, glad to have you join the club. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Happy to be um, here. I don't remember what we were talking about. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> it was something about oh. the sweet spot. And, uh... yeah. so, neurolo- so what happens is the reason why you're overwhelmed is that your brain is flooded with chemicals. Um, Positive chemicals, if you're laughing so hard, or what we might call negative chemicals, um, if you are so sad, so angry, so upset. Um, Learning can't happen in that moment. We just, we know that. Mm -hmm. And so, however, um, there's that little place where emotion is heightened, just enough um, that you're involved, you're engaged. We like that word in early childhood, engaged. And so, um, so where does that happen? In one word, play. Mm-hmm. When you let children play, their affect and they get to control the play. Um, their affect is right in that sweet spot. If you sit them all down and ask them to make the handprint turkey, <laughs> um, some of them, their af- they might be into it, right. and their affect might be ra- uh, raised to that moment, to that point. But it's likely, out of those twenty children. That's maybe three or four, and you've lost 16 of them Mm -hmm. who are not engaged because they want to be drawing a picture of a rocket or building with blocks or outside digging with a stick. Mm -hmm. Um, And so all of this meaningfulness stuff points to play. Uh, Another way I'll, I'll explain it is, so when I was a director, part of my job was that I would give tours to prospective parents twice a month, right? Mm-hmm. Enrollment, enrollment, enrollment. That's yeah. the hard part of being a director. You got to keep your center enrolled. Yes, one of them. And so you give your spiel after you do your tour. And I would say to them that when I was a young teacher, or rather when I was learning how, well, <laughs> I was a young teacher and I was going to school to learn how to be a teacher at the same time, uh-huh. right? I was an assistant teacher back uh-huh. in the 80s and still taking classes. And I was taught, here's what a curriculum looks like. In September, you do all about me. And then in October, that expands to me and my family. And then November, that expands to community helpers. And that seemed to me as a young person really logical. Like, oh, okay, you start with the child, then you expand to the family, and then you move outward toward the community. Yeah, that sounds logical. Okay. So before I ever met my kids, I had my whole year planned out. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, But where I uh, was directing... Uh, it was an emergent curriculum uh, center for infants through uh, pre-kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And I would tell the parents, so that's what I learned back in the 80s. But now what's happened between the 80s and now is neurology, is brain science. We now know we can study what lights up, I'm mm-hmm. using air quotes, mm-hmm. children's brains, human <laughs> beings' brains, and what doesn't. And if you're in November and you're doing community helpers, and you're studying firefighters, but you've got a kid who's really into princesses, um, and you've lined it up so that your letter of the week is F for firefighter, you think you're doing a great job because you're covering your content, Mm -hmm. but you've missed what's meaningful to that kid, that boy or that girl who loves princesses. And so emergent curriculum means it emerges out of the interests of the children. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so as I said in that active childhood UK thing, I had a toddler classroom that did pirates for three months <laughs> because the teachers were trained to be keen observers for engagement and to notice when the subject of pirates was going to stop being engaging and when it was ready to move on to something else. And my older infant room, they did owls for a week or two. Kids got disengaged with that. And suddenly they were into unicorns. And I always thought that made great sense, my explanation. Mm -hmm. And then one of the dads in the tour 
said, well, you know, with all due respect, I need to ask you, Richard, I want my child to go to preschool to get ready for school. Mm -hmm. I don't really care if they know about pirates or unicorns. Mm -hmm. So I don't understand why you would do that. Pirates and unicorns aren't going to help them through life. And I said to him, you know, that is a really good question. I've never thought of it that way before. But the truth is, it's not about the pirates and it's not about the unicorns. The pirates and the unicorns are a means to an end. Mm -hmm. It's what raises their emotional level and it gets them engaged because they're excited about that topic. But meanwhile, I'm facilitating social skills, emotional regulation. I'm weaving colors, letters, and numbers and shapes in there and all the things that are in my state's kindergarten readiness standards, whether I agree with them or not. Mm -hmm. um, it's really not about the pirates. And he said, oh, <laughs> oh, well, that makes sense. And I said, yeah, that's exactly what's going to get your kid ready for kindergarten. Uh -huh. Not the pirates, but all the ways that I use the pirates as a means mm -hmm. to those other ends. Mm -hmm. We can have another conversation about whether those ends are where we really think children Right. Or what's most important for children. Right. But that's a whole different conversation. Baby steps. The <laughs> kindergarten teacher wants me to have those things. Uh -huh. And this is how you get there. Yeah. Huh. I'm just thinking about playing pirates now. Sorry. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> and missing my preschool kids. I had one who was really into pirates. Um, and you're right. If we could tie anything else into pirate play, he was so much more he just smi he smiled all the time while we were doing whatever it is we were doing. And uh, uh, you can, you can see the connections happening almost because of the emotional connection. And then I'm more emotionally engaged um, in what's going on with that. Right. Little, with that little boy. Um, your next section is on love. And um, uh, this is, I've, I'm trying to think of this came up um, in a conversation not long ago, maybe it was just online about whether we should say I love you to children that we're working with. I don't remember if that was you. Anyway, um, so, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just ask you to tell me why you included love as one of the things that we should be thinking about in early childhood education. Uh, well, that <clears throat> section ends with a quote from uh, Dr. Ashley Montague of Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, who talks about love being the foundational um, curriculum upon which every other early childhood subject matter grows. That if there's not love, uh, if you're not um, um, addressing the base of Maslow's hierarchy, uh, the rest of it's kind of irrelevant. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, it's been fascinating to me, though. And again, I, I have a whole keynote called What's Love Got to Do With It? And then when I do that one, I engage the audience in a conversation about have you ever seen that word written down? Is it in your job description? Mm -hmm. Is it in your program's mission statement? Is it in NAEYC's position statements? Nope. The closest NAEYC comes is pro-social skills. Mm -hmm. That's the closest thing I could find to the word love. Mm -hmm. But again, if my job is to introduce children to what it means to be a human being, I can't think of any more important reason for me to be on the planet. Mm -hmm. than to um, be a conduit of love, to give them love, to um, receive their love, um, to understand the difference between love and like. Like, I don't have to like every child in my care, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean I can't um, give and receive love uh, with that child. Mm -hmm. um, and that that's the most important gift that I can give them. Um, we could go down a rabbit hole called attachment. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things, I don't know if I was part of that conversation about whether we should say to children, I love you. It seems um, like you were, but I can't. I, I might've been. Yeah, I don't um, know what it was knows. anyway. Mm -hmm. We spent way too much time together, <laughs> my dear nerd. I have no idea, it all blends together now. I know. Um, but it's been a great gift in my life. Oh. You have, I want to just say that. Oh, you're um, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, uh, now I love, we were talking about love. I know that much. <laughs> oh, so yeah. So, um, I've always said, I love you to children. Uh huh. Me too. Um, always. Um, it's a very controversial stance mm -hmm. when you get, when you look at it through the lens of attachment, we know now that even though our modern world needs childcare, um, 
the kind of stuff that, yeah, maybe this was us because we were talking about Bowlby. <laughs> the kind of yeah, stuff that okay. Bowlby talked about around attachment uh -huh. um, was about one primary attachment, uh -huh. um, neurologically speaking, is what helped form that uh, basis of security. Um, and inherently in our field, you attach and detach and attach and detach year after year. And the science is still out on whether or not that's the healthiest thing. Mm -hmm. It also, by the way, someone pointed out to me recently that that's a very white perspective. Yeah. Um, which was interesting. Yeah. That, that I was missing out on interdependent cultures where attachment aren't just to one person, yeah. but to a collective of, of people who are all caring for that child. Yeah. Um, but either way, it's that same group of people for those first five years of life. Right. Whether it's one or multiple. And that's different than the nature of our profession. Mm -hmm. Attach, detach, attach, detach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the end, if I had to pick between uh, not saying I love you and saying I love you, I'm always going to pick saying right. I love you. And I'm also, by the way, really careful to say to children because they're egocentric, and that's a whole other conversation, <laughs> and they don't understand the difference between what they do and who they are, I'm always careful to say, I love you no matter what, yeah. but I do not like hitting. Mm -hmm. Hitting is not okay. I will never even let you get hit in my classroom, but I love you no matter what. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think we get all tied up in... Uh, so you mentioned the word professionalism in this section. And I think too many people think professionalism means clinical and detached. And, um, but, but for me, professionalism means in our field specifically, professionalism means I understand what the children I'm working with need and why. And then I think about how my actions impact that need. Um, and, and you can't take love out of that because of the, you know, what we know about the importance of relationships and um, attachment uh, and, you know, um, but also just who wants to, I don't know, it's, it sounds really empty and hard and sad for me to think about being intentionally trying to keep myself detached from other human beings, regardless of their age. Right. Um, so, so that that sort of cold idea of professionalism is really hard for me, but I see it a lot. Or, 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 or maybe they feel like that's what they need to believe, and they just need to be given a little bit of permission to um, to think about it differently, or to trust that instinct um, to accept that relationship. Well, you know, it goes back to that first section in the article, which is about personal reflection, uh -huh. about bringing our humanity to work that actually part of being a professional means being a human being with other people's children. Mm -hmm. um, and what a unique professional opportunity mm -hmm. that is. Right. Um, and when you do that, you can't help, at least I can't, I can't help but love. No, me um, And it might be in that section that, where, that, that says you have to redefine professionalism, mm -hmm. this one or the next section, um, when you start considering this. Yeah. Um, Here's what came to mind. Here's a story that came to mind when you started talking about uh, that one of the problems is around love anyway, is how we define professionalism. Uh -huh. I was, I'm in a director's group on Facebook and one of them asked for suggestions on good interview questions for hiring new staff. And I said, well, here's what I've always done when I've been a director or anytime I've hired anyone for an early childhood related position. Mm -hmm. I say to them, now I know when you come to this interview, you think of interviews and so you get dressed in your finest and you want to impress me. Mm -hmm. But um, here's, here's what I'm asking of you. Come to an interview dressed in what you think is professional attire for working with young children. Ooh, and then I so want you tricky. to know that my first question to you is going to be, tell me why you chose what you're wearing. Oh. What does it say about your belief about being an early childhood professional? Uh -huh. And I have to tell you, 100% of the time, someone who comes dressed up in their finest in high heels does not get the job, <laughs> right? If yes. they have the, 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 the ovaries to come dressed up in sweats <laughs> to a job interview, 99% of the time, if they show those other skills uh, and knowledge, 
that's the person who's going to get the job uh -huh. because they know it's not about look being an early childhood professional an effective one is not about looking good uh -huh. it's about getting down on the floor and looking foolish and giving uh -huh. and receiving love and making messes yes yeah this is another area that will come into our conversations about things we've gotten in trouble for <laughs> 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 Unsurprisingly, probably dress code is one of the is on my list. Um, I will tell you, I had a I swear I shit you not. Ooh. I had a young woman when I said that to her, uh -huh. she came in a giant elephant costume. <laughs> swear to God, like one you rent from some That's company amazing. or something. Oh and God. she said, when I said, Tell me about what you think your job is, uh -huh. my job is to entertain young children. Yeah. Well, she okay. didn't get the job. Yeah, that's bless a, her heart. She was a, a different kind of wrong answer. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, I had a woman come to an interview once in a trucker's cap. You know, the trucker hat that says your boyfriend's hat. <laughs> 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 and, um, she also didn't get the job, not necessarily because of her hat, but there might have been some connection. I've had two Down interviewees the <laughs> use the F word in their in the interview. <laughs> In the interviews, <laughs> and one of them did not get the job because oh of the context gosh. of the use of that word. Oh. And the other one was like, as long as you can show me that you know not to use that around children, you so have this job. Right. I guess interviewing I maybe is a free with yourself. Yeah. That you would think, tell episode. me, and that was one of my interview questions. Hmm. So tell me why you thought it was appropriate to use the F word in an interview. <laughs> and it was her answer about authenticity. Oh, yeah. Awesome. That sounds like a fun interview. <laughs> oh, I man. always say my interviews, uh, I have not done a good interview unless I've made them cry. <laughs> oh my God, Richard. Either tears of joy <laughs> or sadness or whatever. Oh, um, that's... If I can't get them to cry in the interview, uh, I haven't done my job. Yet. That's something, man. All right. All right. <laughs> That's where I hold the bar. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm so, inter, <laughs> interviews whole other topic, but um, yes. I also had one woman stop like mid midway through and say, "Wait, what center is this again?" <laughs> so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, just get out. Um, okay, so I had you're a girl. Oh, I'm sorry. Now no, I let's go tell your story. She yeah. brought her mom to the interview. And oh, I've had this husbands. is my mom. She's just going to sit out here while we talk. Yeah. Oh, no, I didn't have a husband. I was interviewing the husband and the wife came along and I was like, you can just wait in the, in, you know, here in the lobby and um, he'll be out before long. And she's like, oh no, I'm coming in. And she came in <laughs> and just sat there through the whole, I was like, you know, he's going to be working in a building full of women. Did he get the job? Um, he did, but he didn't last very long. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, because he was an incredible flirt with all the women was working with yeah that's partially a partially issue. all right so anyway hey let's talk about respect that's the last section of this article is that where we are being we present? sure are yep on respect okay so you i know that you've talked about your platinum rule on the podcast before um I uh, yeah i think it one of the very early episodes that you did with me um so i, I want you to talk about that but respect is one of the words that i hate uh -huh. because of how it's often used because it most often when i hear it used means compliance blind obedience it's very one-sided oh. when i hear people talk about respect in young children um so oh. so this is again what you have written is a totally different perspective on the word and i think your platinum rule nails it if i if i could use grown-up language like that well thank you my dear <laughs> Um, yeah, I was, yeah, I was going to say something like you can nail me anytime, but that's <laughs> probably, it doesn't really get my message across appropriately. That's very inappropriate. Um, but, um, well, come to my, my living goes. room. Anyway, sorry. Right. <laughs> um, no, so my take on it, I've never really heard respect used in terms. It was really interesting to hear you say oh that. Oh my God, you have lived a blessed existence. Well, I, but see, you, you were talking about teacher. Maybe I just misunderstood you. Okay. I, I, what I thought you were going to say is that um, for children to respect adults looks like compliance. Right. But I That's... thought I heard you talking about adults being compliant. No, no, no. What I meant was when adults use the word respect, most often in my experience, they're talking about 
wanting children to respect them and the respect looks like obedience and compliance. Well, it's sort of like, um, but they don't I know think or my... talk about respecting children. So anyway, so right, it's one side. Right. Yeah. Well, what that brings up for me is when I think of, when I work with a group of directors or even teachers and they're so very proud to say how uh, they know their classroom is a good one because the children are so well behaved. Yeah. Um, and I think, well, actually, that's one of my most ma- biggest red flags. Sounds like a when room full of broken spirits to me. <laughs> yeah. By age two or three or four. Oh that's God. yeah, not at all my expectation. Mm-hmm. But in this context, in the article, uh, I talk about the golden rule, mm-hmm. um, which is basically do unto others as you would have them do, do unto, unto you. you. Mm-hmm. That that's what respect means, right? So treat them the way you'd want to be treated. Um, But because I went to Pacific Oaks and I was immersed in anti-bias education Mm -hmm. and just um, so gratefully um, um, just pummeled as a white male um, repeatedly for years. um, And that's what it took to really open my eyes Mm -hmm. to my power and my privilege. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm so thankful to all of those um, uh, women of color that did that for me and that had the courage to point out what kept, I couldn't see mm-hmm. for myself, but it was right there. Um, I realized, especially for me as a white male, um, if I do unto others as they, I would have them do unto me, um, I am so ignorant about what most people want in this world, just by virtue of my mm. um, race and my gender, that I'm likely to treat them disrespectfully. Um, And my goal as a human being is I want people to feel respected by me. And I I realized I'm not going to meet that goal if I treat them how I want to be treated. Because um, it turns out that the world is way more complex and diverse than I thought growing up Mm -hmm. in my little white suburban community. And so I need to do unto others as they would have me do unto them. And so... That means I have to build relationships. Then it opens up the whole topic of relationship-based learning. Mm -hmm. I have to get to know every child in their family and remember what their culture is. And culture doesn't just mean their religion or their ethnicity, but their home culture, Mm -hmm. because they could be of the same religion and ethnicity. But in their unique home, uh, respect looked a very particular way. Mm -hmm. So I have to remember all that. It's much harder work to remember that for this child, they want or need this, or their parents have asked this of me. Mm-hmm. You know, um, the parents have said, just here's one weird little example. Um, I really want my child to call you Mr. Cohen because uh, that's really important in our family or our culture or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but other families are all, no, let them call you Richard, which mm-hmm. is how I would want to be treated. Right, okay. But um, I need to let those ones call me Mr. Cohen, even though what I'd want is to be called Richard. Mm-hmm. Um, they want, their parents want them to learn to call me Mr. Cohen. So I can't ask them to treat me the way I'd want to be treated. I have to remember for each of them what they need or want or their parents want or need for them. Mm-hmm. And then be very individualized in my interactions with them. And that's harder and more exhausting. But it's it's, uh, I hate to use words like right and wrong, but it feels right to me. Mm-hmm. That's it feels respectful. A, yeah. Um, but it, but it's very difficult. Like, I, I don't even know. Um, I don't even know what more I want to say to that other than it is really hard work. Um, and it seems easier to just treat everybody the same way. Um and say, well, I've got 24 children in this class and I can't individualize for each of them, but we can make efforts towards individual. We may not perfectly be able to, to meet that for every one of those children and every one of their parents, but we can make efforts towards that. That can still be our goal, which will guide our intention, um, which, which will, I think, move us in that direction, even if we feel like it's not a hundred percent achievable right away. Well, what I just heard you say is process versus product. Mm. 
understanding that life is a journey and not a destination yeah. and that professional development is a metaphor for child and human development. Mm -hmm. And I'm always in my process of growing towards something. Yeah. Perfectionism will, if, if that's your goal, will kill you because you can never get to that product. Mm -hmm. You're just always in the process of improvement mm -hmm. intentionally, yeah. reflectively. <laughs> Everything is processed to you, Richard. It is. <laughs> which is cool. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so that, that gets us to the end of the article. Is there anything else that you wanted to, to be able to say that we haven't been able to, or that you feel like you want to? No, this is like the, the war and peace of early childhood nerd episodes. <laughs> this has gone on for, this is like a mini series. Know, You're going to have to break this into like five freaking episodes. I'm going to have to do some editing. Uh, which really just means I'll no, go sit in the, editing. well, some dividing, dividing into separate episodes, not dividing. taking anything out. I don't do that kind yes. of editing, um, okay. which just means I'm going to go sit in the living room with my laptop and say, oh, I've got to divide this episode up. And Steve will say, oh, I'll help you. And I hand <laughs> <him the laptop. laughs> it's a great system that we've got here. Um, uh, so thanks, Richard, uh, for both the Thank article you, dear. and the conversation. Um, I think, uh, I, th I definitely know that I read this, like when I first found your Facebook forever ago, and then I didn't think much about it until you did that, um, that Facebook live where you read through it. And, um, yeah. and then I was like, oh yeah, that's a really good piece. Um, so I'm glad that, that you wanted to talk about it on the podcast. Well, thank you mm -hmm. so much for saying that about the piece and for inviting <laughs> me to spend time talking about it with you. Always, you're always welcome on the show, um, and in my texts, and however else we need to do this. All right, thanks everybody for listening. We won't subject you to any more of whatever that was going to turn into. <laughs> and thanks again, Richard, for being on. We'll see you guys uh, all for another episode. Bye. Bye.